If everybody will take their seats, please. We'll get started with our next program. Remember the rule, if you're not seated, you're the next to speak or sing or dance or tell a joke or something. Okay. I love these two people that are here on the stage. They've been part of our Cherry Blossom family a long time as well. And I can remember when we first reached out to find a Monroe descendant, Richard's father originally responded. And when he f visited Marshfield, not only did father attend, but son, and then great-granddaughters of, of Richard's fifth great-grandson, daughters or sixth great-granddaughters, and his, we've watched his two children grow up to be fine, distinguished young ladies. And we miss them this year. But I think he may mention that to you a little bit later. So Richard Gatchell from Maryland, as I mentioned, the fifth great-grandson of President James Monroe, Mary Aker, presidential historian who's been here uh, as a moderator, uh, speaker, history fan, and both of them are excited to share with you a little bit more depth about James Monroe and other founding fathers. Uh, Mary's been after me for years. Something needs to be more in depth about James Monroe at the Cherry Blossom Festival. And this is the year, Mary. Many of you may remember, yes, yes. Uh, Richard, many may remember many years ago when we dedicated the Liberty Tree here at the Cherry Blossom Festival, there was an outstanding program about the Founding Fathers, and Richard gave a excellent presentation on the Monroe Doctrine, and that's been so many years ago. It's always good to hear even more about James Monroe. Uh, without further ado, welcome two wonderful friends, Mary Aker and Richard Gatchell. Well then, T can you hear one, me two. okay? Test one, two, you got me? All right. Well, before we even get started, Richard's got a little present for you, uh, some pictures of... Yes, and by the way, I can't sit still. So I, I apologize, I'm a fidgety person and, and I talk better when I walk around. So first off, I, I wanna thank every person in this room. You've got places to be, you've been here for a while, it's getting late, and I really respect and appreciate you being here. So uh, hopefully at the end of 30 minutes or so or whatever it is, I want you to walk out with an understanding of a little bit more about James Monroe, not just the stuff you're gonna read on Wikipedia, but the stuff in between the lines, maybe some of the stories that you're not gonna uh, have heard previously. And, and I really want it to be in a storytelling uh, realm. So uh, I hope to, to try to keep it kind of fast moving and just kind of give you some snippets and tidbits. And we're gonna do it sort of in two phases. The first will be about sort of Monroe and some of the stuff he's done. And the second, I just finished a book I don't read a lot of books, so that's why I'm excited. Uh, the Virginia Dynasty, it's about the first, why are the first four out of five presidents from Virginia? And what does that mean? And what does that, you know, what does that mean to our country? And it was written by Lynn Cheney, so it was, it was a great book. Um, before I, I even start, wait a second, I wanna walk down. I can't see that thing in the back. So uh, I wanna just click through this, and it doesn't work. Um, yeah. Do I point it somewhere? Ah. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't like me down here. I know. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, oh, on? Hold on a second. It looks See? like a pregnancy, pregnancy I test. I know. I'm a little worried about the answer. There we go. Okay. See, it doesn't work. Am I missing something? Yeah. Do you have it in, the in your pocket, the one that worked? <laughs> no. But what is that what you I did not do that. <laughs> okay, look at this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So let me, let me try. I didn't. Oh, there we go. It worked. Where should I point? I'll just come up here every time. I, I can't start today without thinking about gratitude. Um, I've been coming here for 15 years, and I'm so thankful for the, the town of Marshfield, everyone here that supports this, this event, and all the guests that have come in. It, it's, kinda, it's been such an important part of my life, and, and being the father of two daughters, uh, 
I, I just, I, I can't tell you how much I love them. And, and a lot of people here have watched them grow up. So if we go back to 2009, there's Emery Whitman Gatchel. My, uh, he's my eight-year-old there, and there's Austin, and she's my 10-year-old there. And there's all the cast of characters. My God, Ken Heckler, what a, what a character he was. Um, they've come to just love Marshfield. And I want to also recognize Martha Meyer and her, her late husband, Jim, and their whole family. They've put us up for 15 years. I think I've missed two or three. So we've got to know them, their whole family, and everybody here has welcomed me in. And I, and I just can't tell you how warm that's made me and how much my kids love being here. Right now, uh, they're a little bit older. I, I don't know what's going on in the background, but uh, uh, some must be a pandemic. But there's Austin on the right, and there's Ems, and that's this past summer. And so they've grown up a little bit over the years. Uh, they're now 22 and 20. So this is, and I am married, I've got a wife, and that's Catherine, and she says, this is your thing, right? It's my lineage and, and with the kids, and she really, I think she wants me to get out of the house for four days and, uh, and, and have some time to herself. But, but those are the girls, that was about a year or two ago, and, and um, she, that's, that's what makes me proud. That's why, that's why I get up every day, and, and, and they all feel welcome here, and I want you all to understand how important that is to me. Um, because of being here, I've been granted a lot of opportunities. Uh, two or three years ago, I got a call from the White House Historical Association. They said, would you come plant a tree uh, on behalf of the 200th year anniversary of James Monroe living in the White House? And I said, I said, sure, sounds good. And they said, well, thank God you said yes, because the press release went out 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, uh, so I Googled it, and I said, oh my God, I'm going to plant a tree. And, uh, and there's Mary. I'm sorry, over here, Mary Eisenhower. We were pl they put an Eisenhower tree in, and, uh, and I was there with M Melania, and it was fantastic. She was great. We had a lot of great time uh, speaking with her. And then the, the, we were doing some hard labor that day, and, and I did some people that saw it. They did kind of, I played lacrosse back in the day, and that's how you scoop a ball. And so I, I, I had the good form, I thought. <laughs> um, and then that allowed me to go to the White House with Dad. So this is my father, Dick Gatchel. I think a lot of people have met Dad over the years here. He's 88 and doing well. And here we are, just hanging out, about to hear uh, the President speak and, and the First Lady and the whole cabinet. And then also in there, I, I think a lot of people know Lion Tyler that have come here over the years. Probably the quintessential gentleman that I've ever met in my life. Just an unbelievable individual as the, the grandson of our 10th President, for those of you that don't know. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, that we were able to spend time with him. Um, and then Jennifer Harville, met her back in 2006 here, right, as part of the original crowd. This has made me feel good. George, I wish I had a picture, but you were there too, and Clifton was there, and it was just a, a really special day, and a special week to be there. And it allowed me to be there with my daughter, Emery, and to see one of the, uh, the, the clocks, one of the French clocks that James Monroe bought, brought back from France that's, that's in the uh, lobby of the White House. And, and this one really tugs at my heartstrings. Uh, you all may know Jonathan, right? So Jonathan Sands, I got to know back in 2009 when he stayed at Blackberry Creek. And, um, and, and we've just become friends over the years. And he was in DC giving a speech about the 100th anniversary of the RAF. And I said, Jonathan, pop the train on up to Baltimore. This was in April of 2018. He would not live throughout the end of the year. He died just before Christmas, very sadly. So that's my daughter. She was number one player on badminton. It's actually kind of a, a big sport in Baltimore and kind of a quiet sport like golf. So who shows up but Jonathan? Come on, Emery, hit that shuttlecock. You can do it, mate. Come on, you can do it. And all my friends are like, who's the English guy? <laughs> Razzing and hassling uh, Ems about her. And the thing is, she wins the match, thank God, and then uh, comes over, and there's Jonathan and my dad, and there we are at Roland Park. And that picture is, is one that, that I'll always value. And, and, you know, Jonathan, God rest his soul, he was a real important part of this festival uh, and, and our uh, collective passion for history. So, um, and then we have some fun. God, I think that was two years ago. A couple of bald heads. Larry, where are you? If Larry's in here, I said, there's, I said you, there was going to be a picture of you, right? I didn't know if uh, you were on the left, by the way. Um, and, and so uh, I, I've actually joined this group called the Society of Presidential Descendants, and uh, Massey McKinley been a big part of that in Tweed Roosevelt and they said you need to some of the people said well you got to prove your lineage because if you're you know uh, a Roosevelt or a Johnson or a, or a Carter or a Ford you just say that's my dad that's my grandfather so I have to pull all this together and then we all got it figured out and and one of the great things is my grandmother man she was a hoot 
Elizabeth Courtright Monroe Emery Gatchell. That's a lot, that's a mouthful. She was named after her third great grandmother. And it's through her that I developed the passion and, and knowledge and understanding of who James Monroe was. And, and, and sort of all, all the, the stories between the lines. So um, with that, I will, that's sort of my beginning and my gratitude and my thank you to everyone here and sort of a little background about me. So Mary, I'm gonna take a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> take a sip of water. Mm -hmm. Well, I have two favorite presidents, James Monroe and Jimmy Carter. Yes, I adore them both. And you know, I love, love, love James Monroe. You know, they, they used, historians would say, well, you know, he didn't have the charisma of George Washington, and he didn't have the blazing intelligence of Jefferson and Adams and Madison. And he was just, you know, but what they miss is that this is a man, this was a man with great common sense, great wisdom and also great integrity. And I loved him. And the other thing I call him, Indiana Jones Monroe. Because anytime the country needed something, he'd get on his horse and go do it. So I just um, am just thrilled to be able to tell you about Indiana Jones Monroe. So let's see, we started, he, was, he started his, uh, his service to the country when he was quite young in Williamsburg, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was 17 and uh, when he f had his first sort of call to action, you know, for the country. And then he didn't, that was in 1775, and then he didn't stop until 1825. It was 50 straight years of service in various capacities. And, and yeah, that, that's, that's when he got a start. And then really in the next year was when things started to, started to ramp up for him. Yeah, so he joined the 3rd Regiment, 3rd Virginia Res Regiment, and forced marches to New York to be with George Washington and all of those disastrous battles. And somebody told me, he said, well, don't you think George Washington was a bad general? And what he neglected to understand was that these guys were fighting against the powerhouse of the world at the time, and yet they didn't have sense enough that when they beat the, the uh, Americans to finish them off, they'd go back home and have a party. And it allowed George Washington and his guys to regroup, to, to regroup and to think and to understand and to learn. And hey, and it got to be really bad, but then came the Battle of Trenton. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot that happens. I can't sit still. Uh, in, in 1776, so in the summertime, uh, uh, Monroe's been, been put apart. There's 700 men that joined this regiment in, in Virginia, and they train hard, and they're actually legitimate soldiers of America versus militia soldiers. So they train hard, and then they get the call. They got to go to New York. So it's a forced march, and they, they get up to New York on September 12th. Things aren't going well. For those of you that may know what's going on, there was a retreat across from Brooklyn Heights, and they were getting chased all around Manhattan, and they were getting it handed to them. Like, if it was a, if it was a game score, they were 0-5. You know, they were not doing well. And Jefferson needed some, I'm sorry, uh, Washington needed some help. So luckily, Monroe and his troops got there, and they just had loss after loss after loss. And one thing you need to remember, that if you were a, a troop, uh, if you were assigned, uh, to, to be in the army, you were conscripted for one year. That year ran out on December 31st. So as mid-December was coming and you're 0-5, you're looking down the barrel of a bad season here because we need a win. We, we, have, we need a win. And then they figured the Battle of uh, Trenton, defeating the Hessians there would be a good idea. So they put together this plan where uh, Monroe would go with 40 men, sort of do an end around and, and go in a little bit earlier than Washington across the Delaware and secure the roads in and out of Trenton for escape and for, and for support. And so he did that. And so he goes in and they get across the river and a dog starts barking. Bark, bark, bark. And who, the guy comes out and goes, what's going on? Confound it, who's on my lawn? And, it's the middle uh, of the night. It was the middle of the night. It's the middle of the night. It's a guy named Dr. Riker. And Dr. Riker was a, was a, a 
was a Federalist. He was a, a true American. He goes, who are you? Are you uh, Hessians or not? And he goes, no, we're, we're actually going in to do it like a sneak end around. There's going to be a big battle. And he goes, I'm a doctor. You may need my service. So he grabbed his bag, and he joined the 40 troops. Well, they get there, and they're on sort of the, the side road of Trenton. Meanwhile, the main troops, about 8,000, are coming up from crossing the Delaware and did a seven-mile hike through the snow. And they're about to attack the front end of the Hessians, and Monroe and his troops are recognized, and they see that the Hessians are turning cannons to shoot at, at Washington and the oncoming troops, and they charge. And there's a skirmish, and there's a battle, shots fired. And who's the other gentleman, Washington? Well, William Washington, a distant cousin of, of right, George Washington. Of Washington. They were the two generals, and uh, Monroe's a lieutenant. He shot in the hand, and Monroe shot in the shoulder. And in, throughout the skirmish, not many people died. It was, it was a very low casualty battle. But they were able to get the, make it so that the cannons did not fire on Washington, and they came in, and the battle was over quickly, very quickly. Um, there's a, a painting that's done later on. I don't know if you can see this very well. But at that painting, the surrender of the Hessians to One Washington more. on the One ground more. here, you can barely see Dr. Riker and, and, and Monroe, who had a shot, and his artery was burst, and Riker clamped it down and saved his life that night. And if he hadn't been there, he would have bled out because there was no, there was no support. And, uh, you know, there was no, uh, he didn't yell medic, and a guy showed up. Um, so thank God the dog barked. You know, the, the history is, the, the fabric is so fine and thin of the difference of the serendipity and, and how things act. And I, I literally think about a dog barking, changing the, I thank God that dog barked, otherwise I'm not here misusing this control. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, that got them their win. And then it was also on Christmas night, five days before all the guys entered their conscription. So they, they kind of used them right to the very end, but then that kind of turned the tide. And they said, you know what? Maybe we got a chance here. And then I think it was a victory before or after at the Battle of Princeton. And it, it just it gave the momentum that they needed and the confidence. And really, the, the, uh, the confidence in the French to then say, I think these guys have it going on. They were 0-5. I don't want to support that team. And then that allowed, uh, I think, Lafayette and other people to fund visits over it and trips and support to the, uh, you know, to the American cause. So that was a really critical battle. Oh, crossing the Delaware. Um, who, we all know this painting, right? I got a cheat sheet here. Hold on one sec. When was this painting painted? Um, I can't find it. Where are we? 1860 or something. 1851. 51. By, uh, where is that? Hold on a second. Trying to find it. By Lutz. Uh, yeah, so crossing the Delaware. There's only four real people in this picture. That, that This guy painted it in 1850. It's an American that painted it in Germany to try to uh, help people to uh, uh, get the courage to, to, to do what America did, to, to rebel and to revolt. And so in this picture, everybody knows George. That's Monroe right there. That's Nathaniel Green, and that's a guy named something Hand, I think was his general. So there are four real people painted into this picture. The rest were all uh, a segment of, of some part of the United States uh, makeup, whether it be uh, there's a Scotsman, there's a frontiersman, there, there's various different people there. But I, we all see this picture, but it was painted uh, 75 years later. So uh, it was not done the next day, is this thing was fresh in memory. And, so, and, and the thing is about, about Monroe in that painting, Monroe had already crossed the, crossed the river hours before and was already down, you know, six miles down the road towards Trenton. So, but it's kind of cool to have him in that picture, don't you think? Yeah, the inaccuracies are unbelievable. The flag's wrong. Like, like there's a lot of things that are wrong in it. But, uh, but you just got to go with it, you know? You it's like it. a B movie. You just and those go. boats, the boats that they, that they were in are called Durham boats. And they were built for great stability for... Uh, hauling iron ore, ores, heavy, heavy stuff. So they knew they were going to, you know, even through all of that ice. Can you imagine crossing a river with all of that ice? Scary, scary, scary. Yeah, in a snowstorm. So uh, Monroe was not able to raise a regiment. He kind of had a, a, a challenge for a couple of years. But then he came back working for Lord Sterling. And his job was to be battlefield communications. So it's uh, get on your horse 
and go tell those guys what they got to do, retreat, back up, go left, go right. So he's in the middle of battles all the time, bullets flying, but he's on his horse, a great horseman. On his horse, said, on his going and doing what needs to be done. done. And, and working for that. And then he did evolve into sort of a uh, working as a spy network ring leader for uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was the governor of Virginia. Jefferson wanted to know, where's the enemy? That's a good question. He didn't just pull up your GPS or do whatever. He went out and had a series of, of riders and, and people that were tracking where Cornwallis was, especially in Southern Virginia, because they did not want to get uh, you know, invaded, whether, whether they were in uh, Williams, Williamsburg or uh, Richmond. It was like an advanced Pony Express. He, uh, Monroe put horses and riders at various places, and Jefferson had hoped that they would be able to get from uh, the Carolinas back to Virginia in three days, Monroe did it in two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so is, is there sort of the timeline of Monroe? I wanna, I wanna kinda put that timeline on hold for a sec. I wanna shift gears. And I wanna talk about this book and the importance of this book and the importance, it's called the Virginia Dynasty, Four Presidents and the Creation of the American Nation. So as we all know, and I'm just gonna assume everybody knows, Four of the first five presidents were from Virginia. And uh, John Adams, the second president, was from Massachusetts. So they kind of had a, you know, they had a corner on presidents for, for a while. And, and really the question comes out. You've got four men that grew up, that were born within 60 miles of each other in Virginia in the early to mid part of the 18th century. How did these four men come to lead a rebellion, a revolution, write a constitution, form a republic, and create a, a country that went from the Atlantic to the Pacific in their lifetimes. It, it, it's a lot for four people. What, what is the common, what's the special sauce there? It's, it's a really, it's a great question. And this book answers a lot of those questions. They were all sort of born, none of them were, were wealthy people. And, and, and the more you read it, and I hate to say it, it's a tragic story. Each of those men suffered tragedies. It was not an easy thing. Starting a revolution, you had three choices, right? You won, or you died trying, or if you lost, you were shot because you were an officer. And so two out of three is not a good odds there. So thank goodness they won, but when your back's against the wall, you're gonna do a lot of different things to win. So these four guys are, are really unbelievable. And throughout, if you put a matrix of all four of them, at some point in their lives, they had incredible friendships, and then they were foes. They quarreled. They argued, and, and, and really, if you want to break down the teams, and, and I'll keep this at a high level, on team one, on the Federalist team, you had Washington, you had Hamilton, and you had Adams. And on the Democratic-Republican side, you had Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. It was a struggle and a power grab between how much did we want the federal government to, to, to run in our country, and how much did we want the states to have ownership. And it was a great tug of war. It, it was a very... Uh, honest and intellectual tug of war. Things got ugly, things got testy at times, but they worked it out. And uh, throughout their lives, they, they, always, they always stopped and put the country first. That's, that's the, one of the great selfless things about these men uh, that I've come to find. Um, but, but I think their relationships as it goes on is, is, is really unbelievable. And it, there's tragedy there, right? So these three of the four died penniless. They were broke. They had to, at the end of their lives, Thomas Jefferson had to sell Monticello. He was broke. He, they were all land rich, but, but cash poor. Being a, being a politician didn't pay, right? So you weren't making money. At the end of Monroe's presidency, he added up what he thought the government owed him, and it was $23,000 plus $30,000 in interest. That's for 50 years. And the government gave him $29,000. That allowed him to chip away at his debts. He was in debt. Madison was in debt. Jefferson was in debt. Luckily, Washington was able to, 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 to get through sort of debt free. But this debt just, just dragged on these guys and, and, and hampered them. And it was, it, it's very sad to know that at the end of his life, Jefferson had to sell his house. Monticello, uh, uh, Montpelier barely made it. Uh, let's see, this is um, Ashlawn Highland, is, is the, the, the home of Monroe back in the, you know, from sort of 1790 to about 1815. I could be wrong on the dates. He had to sell that, he had no money. I think it's, it's very sad that these people had to do that and then live in, in sort of this impoverished world later in their lives. I, I just think uh, 
that you, when you think of these founding fathers, there's maybe a, 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 there's this virtuous greatness and, and happiness and joy. Not a lot of happiness and joy. It was very difficult. A lot of these guys suffered incredible pains throughout their lives. And um, I, I want to share a quote that um, it's not too cheery, but it's necessary to hear. It's necessary to understand. Um, at the end, in 1825, Thomas Jefferson is, is old. He is, as I think a lot of us know, Jefferson died on July 4th, 1825, and up in Massachusetts, Adams died later on on the same day. They, had had, they were at odds a lot of their lives. This is a quote from letters that were sent back and forth as they were repairing things. And the question is, would you choose to live life again? Adams, who had lost his parents and Abigail and children and friends, said, instead of suffering these griefs again, I would rather go forward and meet my destiny. He'd been that grieved. Like, life had been that tough for him. Jefferson said, the pleasures surely outweigh the pains in life. Why not taste them again? But he was on the fence. They'd all suffered a lot. And, and they were, I mean, th those are really uh, telling answers between the two of them. Uh, it's just, it, it's amazing to, to know sort of what these guys went through. Um, what, what they, speaking of finances, when you were president in 18, whatever, 16, try to, how much did you make? Anybody idea? Probably don't. $25,000, right? And, and so today, you can be unemployed and sit at home and make more than that, you know? 600 a week gets you to 31,000. 25,000, that was a salary. He, he had to pay for upkeep at the White House. He was, he was on the hook for that. It was called the President's House at the time. He had to pay for all the, you know, all the food. Whenever he entertained dignitaries, he had to pay for all that stuff. No wonder he went in debt. And he said, I want to entertain, I want to enjoy. And his, his wife, Elizabeth, wanted to entertain and look good and dress well. And it, it put them farther and farther in debt. It's really this sort of risk reward thing. He goes, it's better for the country, but it's going to dig me farther underground. And it was, it was unfortunate that, that it was that way. Um, in 1829, I think, uh, 1826, he gave that bill. He got some money back. And in 1830, he, um, the government gave him another $30,000 and said, thanks for everything. Here's $30,000. At the same time, they gave Lafayette $200,000 as a, as a real thank you. True story. Yeah, he got $200,000. But Lafayette, he's a pretty special guy. So um, that's, th that's some of these, these unbelievable aspects of these guys. I and mean, if you think about it, you know, wa uh, Washington's the grand leader, right? And, um, uh, you know, Madison was the intellect. Madison was so smart. This guy, he wrote the Constitution, he wrote the Bill of Rights, he was, he was a part of all this stuff. He was just a guy that grinded it out, he, incredibly intellectual. Jefferson was this sort of savant visionary and, and imagination guy and intellect and, and international guy. And then Monroe, so he, he was not brilliant. He was not the top of his class. I think what we would call him, is he, he was a man of wisdom. Um, he listened more than anybody else. He knew that the committee approach was important to him. He, when he first took over, he had a cabinet meeting, and the previous cabinet meetings were like, you know, a couple hours, lunch, and then we're out of here. Four days later, he's still in his cabinet meeting. He goes, nobody can leave. I value the opinions of all these people. And he was very calculated in his decisions, what he did, and, and that was important to him, to make good, sound decisions and not rush anything. That's sort of one of his... Uh, unique characteristics of being able to listen, being a man of integrity and character, whereas the others kind of had their, their aspects of them too. So, and it's like, he, he didn't really like the Constitution because he felt it was incomplete without the Bill of Rights. I mean, this man was wise. He was kind. And you know, Jefferson wrote to um, uh, Madison one time, and he says, you turn his soul inside outwards, and there's not a speck on it. <laughs> so, so let's go through a little bit more of the timeline, right? Of, of, so here we are. So he was elected president in 1816, and then uh, so he took, took office in 17 and then left in 25. He was the first president to do a tour of the country, right? So he said, I've got to check this place out. And he was really doing more of a, of a physical check of where are the mountains, where are the rivers, how can we defend ourselves? 
because it was his belief that the federal government, their job was to protect the people from foreign interests and to ensure the laws that they had. That's it. They're not there for health care. They're not there for unemployment. They're not there for all these other things that, that things may have evolved into. But he goes, protect the people and, and, and take care of the interest and make sure that we protect the laws of the people. And then let everybody kind of play by whatever their pursuit of happiness is going to be. Um, so he toured the country. And he was blown away by people. Think about it, 1817, there's no photographs. No one had seen a president. He goes up into New Jersey and Massachusetts. No one had ever laid eyes on a president. People came out, they loved him, they adored him because of his title. And, and he was blown away by that. Meanwhile, he's paying for the whole trip on his own dime, too. So, uh, so he, he did the whole, he did a tour of the North, and then later on he did a tour of the South. But he was blown away by the passion that the people had to see their president, shake his hands, get up close to it, and, and it really made a, a, a profound effect on him. Um, and then, I'm just thinking chronologically, in 1819, there was, they called it the Panic of 1819, the First Depression, right? Everything was going along, humming along pretty well. This depression hit, and land values went down. So a lot of people that were always, when you had this much land, you could just sort of sell off this, sell off this, sell off this, and just sort of, it was like an ATM kind of thing, because land was abundant everywhere. Um, but w once this depression hit, you just couldn't sell off that land. So a lot of people that were land rich didn't have money. It was, very, it was, it was about a three year depression. And they asked him, they, they said, are you going to intervene and interject and jump into this? And he says, no, that's not the role of the federal government. The markets are going to do what the markets are going to do. We are here to protect our borders and protect our people. A much different sentiment than, than may or may not be today. But, you know, the, uh, the, the panic subsided. Things got back to, I don't know if you want to say normal, but that's sort of an unbelievable uh, aspect of how he, um, you, you know, he handled that situation of, of staying hands off today. I mean, every day, the Fed's involved in, you know, rates, this, that, and the other. So it's just sort of a, a dichotomy of 200 years ago and 200 years, you know, later. Um, and speaking of 200 years, I'm fascinated. It's one of my favorite stories when I ever learned about Monroe. It was uh, the election of 1820. I don't know how many of you here know what happened in the election of 1820. It's the only election of its kind. Um, the Federalist Party, which had been Washington and Hamilton and, and really all about, uh, you know, the, the, the federal movement, was really dying out. They didn't have a candidate. They, so they just didn't put anybody up for presidency. So on this side, you had nobody. And then they thought, well, Monroe's doing a pretty good job. Let's not even have a, you know, a runoff to see who that's going to be. So he was automatically nominated. So he ran unopposed. One guy did not vote for him because he had a bone to pick with him from years before. And he said, hey, well, I don't want to say the term, but uh, uh, I'm not on my watch. So he had one electoral vote against him. But he basically won in a landslide. Um, think about today. Think about if Donald Trump uh, said, you know what, if the Republican Democrats said, you know what, that's cool, you're doing a great job, we're just not going to put somebody up this year uh, because we don't have anybody competent. And then they, they also said, well, we, all these other guys that want to play, they don't think they can touch you, so we're just going to have you go again with no vote, really, or just sort of a, you know, a mock vote. It's just, it blows my mind that a president was elected without a real vote. And that was 1820. And then at the end of his presidency, it was known, there's a term that was known as the era of good feelings. And um, if anybody watches Jeopardy in the last week or two, when Aaron Rodgers was on, they, they had uh, vice presidents. And the $2,000 question was Tompkins. And I'm, I'm yelling at the TV, I'm like, Monroe, it's Monroe. It's, he was the vice president of Monroe. <laughs> Nobody got it. And Aaron Rodgers kind of gave me the old, James Monroe? So I, I kind of like the, uh, threw a little attitude out of like, come on guys, you got to know this stuff. So, so that's, I mean, so that kind of takes us up to 1820. And that, so he's in the mid latter part of his thing. Anything else you want to add? Because I've got another sort of thought. Well, you haven't talked about Bladensburg yet. I haven't. That was back. That was 1814. That was before. I'll let you talk about that a little bit and I'll, I'll pinch hit if you need me to. Oh, well, all right. Well, here, here's the, the British, right? coming back over, ticked off, and they had just finished stomping Napoleon's butt in the Spanish campaign. So like they're the strongest power in the world, 
and they come back over to the United States and think they're going to take care of us. So they land, and the uh, Madison's uh, Secretary of War doesn't send out any scouts to see where the British are, because he said, it's not necessary. And Monroe said, oh, yeah, it is. So he's 56 years old. He climbs on his horse, and he goes and does what's necessary. He goes and he goes all across here, and he's in the saddle for, I don't know, five or six days scouting out where the British are. And finally comes back, and the British by this time have gotten to this horrible place. Well, it wasn't a horrible place, but it was a horrible battle called Bladensburg, Maryland. And this is one of the worst defeats in, the, in American history. It was just horrible. And he, by this time, he had come back, and he and Madison are standing there watching this horrible thing, knowing that, um, that they're going to go on to Washington, D.C., and it's not going to be a good thing. And so James Monroe gets on his horse, rides back to Washington, D.C., tries to tell everybody what's happening, help get Dolly Madison out of the White House, get to safety, and um, he... You know, it didn't, it, here's the interesting thing to me. Dolly Madison scarcely got out of the White House before the British came in. And this is how narrow escape she had. There was already food on the table for their dinner when she escaped and the British came in and ate that food. And then of course, they burned Washington because why, we burnt, so yeah, so there was a there was an unwritten rule, but I guess in war I don't have an unwritten rule. Uh, 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 but in that rule, when we were up in Canada, the, you know, the U.S. troops, the capital of Canada was York at the time, and we burned York to the ground. Not that's part of the unwritten rules. So when the British got to D.C., they torched D.C. and they sort of said, "Remember York," and they, in my mind, they had every right to, and that was September of 1814, and. That was a bad time because in 1840, in September, they burned the White House. Dolly Madison got away. Uh, uh, Monroe was the third Secretary of War in that in that war, and then the British said, "That's it. We're going after Baltimore. Those hoodlums, and you know, pirateers or whatever. That's my town. So those are my people." And they had two battles up to New, uh, up to Baltimore. There was a land battle that ended in Patterson Park where there was a 15-year-old kid who was a sniper that picked off their lead general. The, the British troops didn't know what to do. They panicked and they turned around and they left. And then they tried the, uh, you know, the assault on Fort McHenry. And we all know the story of how that went and, uh, and that they were repelled. And the next day, you know, they were not able to get through. And uh, uh, Francis Scott Key, who was a, a Baltimore lawyer, had been taken captive on one of the command ships and he wrote the Star Spangled Banner on the back of an envelope during the battle and to, a, to, a, uh, to an old Irish, uh, a British drinking song. So uh, there's the original copy in the Maryland Historical Society of Oh Say Can You See. It's really unbelievable. I, I'm, I'm very proud to be from Baltimore. And, and I, I, when people come in town, I take them down to uh, Fort McHenry. I think, I think it's a great spot. Um, but then that was 1814. And then we, we repelled them. And I think they were going to surrender a Treaty of Ghent, if I'm not sure. And that was signed before the Battle of New Orleans took place. So the Battle of New Orleans took place after the war actually ended by, by, by treaty in, uh, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, Jackson and all of his pirates and frontiersmen and Indians and whoever else, they stomped them. Like, you know, I mean, I've never been able to understand why the British thought it was a good idea to march with all the, I mean, just. All you had to do is just shoot, 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 and they were dead, you know. And that's exactly what happened in 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 New Orleans. I mean, they, here they come marching, and Andy Jackson said, "Fire!" and in in just minutes, that whole that whole all of those Englishmen were lying dead. Just like the song says, you know, Battle of New Orleans. And you know what? There, I think there were only about seven Americans that were killed mm -hmm. in that whole battle. Right. One of them happened to be Thomas 
Thomas Jefferson's nephew, hmm. uh, Isham Lewis. Well, I'm thinking about 1820, as I often do. And, uh, and Lynn, I'm going to look at you, and I, and I think about all the things that transpired later to start the Civil War. And the Missouri Compromise was really, I think, a key issue that, that helped spark it. And to bring Missouri in is a, is a free slash slaveholding state with a compromise of sorts. It was really not a, a clear designation. And then to put Maine in as a free state and then draw the line, a parallel line, saying any state that ever comes in north of here will be free, and anything south of here will be a slave state. Big mistake. Really big mistake. And that laid the groundwork for 31 years later, as, as well as, you know, Dred Scott and, and a number of other things. There's a quote that I, that I read that I think is pretty compelling. A lot of people were, 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 took umbrage with that, and they didn't think the Missouri Compromise was a good idea. John, John, Adam, John Quincy Adams said, a compromise might delay catastrophe, you think? Um, and then he said, this is the title page to a great tragic volume. He was right about that. That's the cover page, everything else that went bad. The third one was setting free states against slaveholding states would kindle mutual and moral hatred. I think he got it right on all accounts, sadly, you know, very sadly. Um, uh, we've talked about the Monroe Doctrine. I want to be cognizant of time as well. Um, there, there's, there's another quote that I want to uh, say, and is I kind of want to start to wrap things up. But at the end, at the end of Monroe's life, it was sad. You know, he he was he, uh, he, his presidency ended in 1825, and the elections of 1824. There's actually this is kind of a, a bizarre story. There's one guy Crawford that was not happy with Monroe's endorsement of somebody or not of somebody, and in the White House, Crawford took his cane and was about to hit Monroe. Monroe saw it and picked up an andiron, uh, picked up a, a fire tool from the fireplace and held him off. This is in the White House. A guy trying to hit him over the head. And uh, he was taken out pretty quickly there on. But these guys were passionate. You know, it's a, you know, it, it's a, uh, 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 that was in 1825. So then he leaves there and he goes and he lives. He moves closer to DC. This is called Oak Hill. A uh, beautiful house about it. He said, as they call it, a half day's ride outside of D.C. I love a half day's ride. That's, that's a lot of traffic in my mind. Um, and it, it, so we live there, and then he lived there. He was getting sort of older and more frail. And then the year 1830 comes, and his wife, uh, Elizabeth, who he, he adored and been married to for 44 years, she'd been ill for a, a number of years. She died in that house in 1830. And in that same year, uh, Monroe has, had, has two daughters. The eldest daughter, uh, Eliza, was married to George Hay. George Hay died in 1830. So now his wife's dead, his son-in-law's dead, and Eliza's kind of a pain, and they had nowhere to go. Like, they were broke. They were destitute again. He had to sell Oak Hill because he didn't have any money. The following February, that's when the government gave him another $30,000, but it was too little too late. So he had to sell a second estate and moved to New York City, and he had to live with his other daughter, Mariah, who was married to Samuel Governor, and that's who I come down from. So think about this end of a life. You've, you've 50 years of, of, of giving to your country, and you're 72, and, and, and you go up to New York City, and you gotta bum a room from your daughter. Your wife's dead, you gotta bum a room from your daughter. Your, your other daughter's at odds with that. It's just, it's not a happy, you know, it's not a joyous ending that people want to write a storybook ending to. The same way a lot of the other guys. Jefferson didn't have a glorious ending. Um, you know, either did Madison. So then, then he's, he's lamenting the fact that he can't really move very well. And, and he misses his friends. You know, obviously, uh, uh, Jefferson already died, but Madison was still alive. But here's a letter he wrote. Here's a, a snippet of a letter he wrote to uh, Madison. This is him very old in, in 1831. I deeply regret that there is no prospect of ever meeting again. Since so long we have been connected in the most friendly public and private life, our final separation is among the most distressing incidents that could occur. These guys were beautiful writers. That's sad. I, I think that's sad. And Hamilton's response from Montpelier, the prospect of our never meeting again afflicts me deeply. 
the pain that I feel at the idea associated as it is with the recollection of the long, close, and uninterrupted friendship which uh, united us amounts to a pang that I cannot well express. That was in the spring of 1831. And on July 4th, 1831, Monroe died, five years after his two other friends and, and uh, patriots had died in 1826 on July 4th. So three of the first five presidents died on, on that. In my mind, it's a sad, it's a sad ending. Um, as is, I mean, to, to, to die without your wife and penniless and, and kind of having a, you know, a, a you know, bum a room from your daughter is tough. Jefferson went through a lot of the same thing. Uh, uh, Madison went through a lot of the same things. His, Dolly Madison died close to poverty in DC after he had died. And each of these men had people in their lives that were sort of blood-sucking leeches. His brothers were always, he was always having to bail them out, always having to cover them. Um, Madison had a son-in-law that was just horrible that he figured that he, he had uh, taken care of $20,000 worth of death for this guy by the end. Washington had a granddaughter marry a guy that was a real scumbag that, 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 that closely bankrupted them. And Jefferson had some people within his family tree that were just not people of integrity. So all these men just felt this, this compelling need uh, to cover the financial cost of the people in their down line. And, and, and it put three or four of them in bankruptcy. And, and I, I, think, I think that's sad. I don't mean to leave you all on a sad note. I want to leave you on an honest note about what it was like. It, it, was, it was difficult. And, and I think today when, you know, we see people, uh, you know, look at our founding fathers and, and make disparaging marks because, for various reasons, it, it hurts me because they don't understand the sacrifice and the pain that they had. And, and the fact that we are living in a free society today that, that is born of their efforts and that there should be sort of, a, I think, a better recognition and respect and a more of a macro picture of understanding uh, who these people were. So. Uh, I'm exhausted, Mary. I'm well, <laughs> I, we, I, you know that's you know that's really painful for us to hear that you know we they own slaves and that k kills kills you you know but they had good parts that they did they had good things that they did and it, you know we're just trying to deal with it now but I want to end with a, a sweeter story that when Monroe was the diplomat in France mm -hmm. and Lafayette was already in jail in Prussia, Prussia? Mm -hmm. Bel Bel I forget where, Prussia. And, uh, and his wife was imprisoned in Paris. Yeah, so, so, uh, when, so Monroe had two different stints in, in Europe, in, in, in France for that matter. And he spoke French fluently, by the way. I, I, I'm gonna, by the way, a, a few times here. They spoke French in the White House. Like, that was their preferred language. And the girls spoke French. So they were, it, it's kind of a, a bizarre story, nobody knows. So they're there, they get off the boat three days after Robespierre was beheaded in, in the, the, the reign of terror in, in France. So there was not a lot of protectionism and understanding of, of sort of who these people were as, from, as a diplomatic standpoint. And Lafayette was a, you know, was a aristocrat. And his mother, his aunt, and his sister had all been beheaded. And his wife was in jail and, and, and due to be beheaded at some point very soon. Um, Lafayette and Monroe got to know each other very early on in the war and became lifelong friends and, and, and had a great friendship. And, and, so, and so did Madame Lafayette and Elizabeth. So Elizabeth put on her finest dress and got the finest carriage and went to the jail where uh, Madame Lafayette was being held and demanded to see her. And they took her back and she thought that literally they were coming to get her and take her. Uh, to the guillotine, and it was Elizabeth Monroe. And, and you know, she was so emotionally exhausted by it because she thought that, that it was her time that I think the guards and the people said, maybe we should hold off now because these are those people that came from America and they're our allies and we should hold off. And I think they begged for it, and she was never beheaded. And then so she was, she was reunited. She was allowed to go live with Lafayette in prison in Prussia with two kids. They actually allowed them to live in a prison cell together for a couple of years. And then what happened to... You know, he was actually uh, able to get free and then had a whole other stint of things in, in, uh, in France. But um, it was, you know, it was an amazing story of, 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 uh, of courage because they could have said, get in the jail cell with her and, and you're gone, you're a goner tomorrow. But it didn't happen. So 
uh, you know, I'm proud of that and, and, and certainly proud of, of the bravery that she showed. Absolutely. That shows you what ladies can do even when they can't vote. Mm. Mm. <laughs> All right. I want to be respectful of time. It's 6.30, I don't know if there was an end, but I, I, I want to say also something, and I, I, <laughs> as I'm respectful of time, um, I, I'm so happy. Everybody was in this room. I never saw that door open. Thank you. It really means a lot to me. This is the last, you know, the last of many speeches and stuff today. It, it means a lot to me. And once again, it started with gratitude of, of Marshfield and all the attendees, all the friends that I've made, and it ends with a thank you. Uh, for, 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 for being with me on this. And, and a, a big thank you to Mary Aker, too. So, thanks. Dearly, dearly, dearly. So glad to see everybody. Anything it's else? I think I covered it all. Time. He was on a $100 bill. Figure that. <laughs> <laughs> then he got off. Let's give mm -hmm. Richard and Mary another round of applause. Did you learn something about James Monroe you didn't already know? See, you accomplished your goal. Now, I see Monroe's on the $100 bill. Did you know George Cleveland was asked to sign a $1,000 bill today with Grover Cleveland's picture on it? Yeah, it's true. You were, weren't you? The cover of it. Yeah, the cover of it. Pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, thank you, for Richard's correct, for staying so late today. Remember, this evening at 7 o'clock at the Marshville Senior Center will be the Cherry Blossom Jam Session. You are all welcome to go to that. Um, I would certainly encourage you to go out and support our local businesses as you are thinking about dinner plans tonight. But if you do not have dinner plans, there will also be a food truck outside of the Senior Center uh, from one of our vendors that's been on the square to provide food for you in a more COVID-friendly situation. Also, remember tomorrow, the Evelyn Hampton Garden Club will have a plant sale in my garage if it rains, um, beginning at 9 a.m. in the morning till they run out of plants. You all need to take them home. I don't want to be stuck with them. And then we will have booths, um, hopefully outside, if the weather's good tomorrow. They'll still have the autograph show from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Marshfield Community Center. Or if you hear us locals refer to it as the MAC or the old junior high school, it's all the same location, but it's listed on your program as the Marshfield Community Center. Also, uh, we will still have the silent auction items that are being listed uh, that are for available in the foyer, and those will be unveiled, I guess you could say, or revealed who will be taking them home at the state dinner tomorrow night. So some of you have asked about the state dinner. It is sold out for tomorrow night. Uh, but if you see Carol Cooksey and you'd like to be put on a waiting list in case there's any last-minute cancellations, feel free to do that. Tweed Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's great-grandson, will be our speaker making his first visit to Marshville. So again, thank you all. It's good to see both of you. You've been a special part of our Cherry Blossom family, um, dating back many years. And we owe you a, de a great debt of gratitude for continuing to make the trip to Marshville. Give them one more round of applause. See you tomorrow morning. <laughs>